Align CCUS stands for Accelerating Low Carbon Industrial Growth Through CCUS. Align CCUS is a project within ACT. ACT means Accelerating CCUS Technologies. The current ACT projects are funded by the participating countries and the EU through Horizon 2020. The countries involved in Align CCUS are Romania, Germany, United Kingdom, Norway, and the Netherlands. CCUS is a, Align CCUS is a project addressing the full CCUS chain. That means that there are, there's work defined on capture, transport, storage, and utilization. The technical results of the project will be used in studies on making blueprints, how to decarbonize industrial areas. Also studies on public perception are an important part of Align CCUS. This is the third webinar for Align CCUS. All webinars have been recorded, so you can watch it online through our website. Also, other information about the project can be found there. And you can subscribe for the Align CCUS newsletters that will be sent out regularly, addressing interesting topics of the project. This webinar is focused on the CO2 transport work in Align CCUS. Uh, on the next slide, I will show the agenda of today. Um, so we will start off with a presentation of Ragnar Skakastad from Sintef about uh, ship transport of CO2 opportunities and challenges. Then uh, Marielle Koenen from TNO will continue about preventing injectivity impairments by soil precipitation during batch-wise CO2 injections. The next is Anna Korra for Imperial College London about flexible CO2 transport and storage network. And we will end with a presentation of Arne Duxstedt from IFE on impurities in the CO2 stream, when is corrosion an issue? After those presentations, we will start a live questions and answer uh, session. I would now like to introduce uh, Ragnild Skarsat as the first presenter. Ragnild is a senior scientist at Sintef, and in Align CCUS, Ragnild leads the task on technological challenges of CO2 shipping and offshore unloading. Okay, Ragnild, go ahead. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ragnar Skagestad, I work in Sintef. I'm uh, located in Posten in Norway, and I will give a talk about the co 2 ship transport opportunity and challenges. So, um, then I can say next, please. There are several ways to uh, transport CO2. You can do it in ship in different sizes, in a pipeline and trucks and railways and barges. Today, I will focus on ship transport and compare it with pipelines. That is because these transport modes can transport large volumes, and with CCS and CCUS, we need large volumes. Next, please. This is a picture of a CCS chain from the source that had CO2 emissions and the capture plant, and then you have conditions before transport, Maybe you need to liquefy it or remove impurities uh, and storage before the transport. Because of course, for ship transport is batch wise, so we need to store it before transport. The red square shows where what's included in the transport part, but that changes for every project. It is therefore important to agree on what, what is included or not included in your if you're going to compare cases or projects. For example, the removal of impurities may be included in the, um, in the transport part, but also in the capture plant. So for comparison, comparison, it's important to show where are the battery limits or the, what's included or not. Um, after the transportation, you have uh, injection and storage, which is the different part. And you can say that offloading may be a part of the injection system or maybe part of chip transport. So you have to be aware of what is included and not in this project. Next, please. A lot of people say that the ship transport of CO2 is a walk in the park. Well, it has been done for decades and we have all the experience we need to do it, but um, it's still, it's not straightforward. It is um, quite costly and uh, we have not decided which temperature and uh, conditions, uh, for instance, the pressure that is um, 
um, optimum. And uh, some of the different um, conditions may have different advantages and disadvantages. SHIP introduced also the batch-wise um, deliverable in opposite of the pipeline, which has continuously um, deliverable of the CO2. So we need to handle impurities in the CO2 and water content in particular. We need to design transport and storage network, and at least it's quite costly, as I said. It required um, energy and fuel for the, for the ship and also uh, investing in, in the ship. So next, please. There are a lot of different um, transport conditions. Uh, I've just mentioned some of them. Uh, you can transport it with high pressure. That is normal for the onshore pipeline today. Uh, but uh, if you're going to transport it with the um, ship, then it uh, requires quite thick vessels for storage. Uh, and that is very costly due to the high pressure. The food grade um, industry transport uh, medium pressure CO2 today. They are like uh, 15 bars and minus 28 degrees. That is quite optimal for small volumes, but if you have um, uh, if you have larger volumes, the, the cost will increase quite a lot. So for this um, condition, it's quite low liquefaction cost, but uh, the, um, it gets higher vessel cost due to having a um, CO2 stored with uh, with higher pressure. So continuing to the low pressure alternative which is uh, close to 7 bar and minus 50 degrees. That is near the triple point, and um, you will have... Um, um, the density is higher, so you can have more CO2 uh, in the same volume tank. But uh, it's, uh, the, it requires higher liquefaction cost and then lower tank costs, so that's good. And um, it also may be some challenges regarding material because the low temperature here. But uh, the medium pressure and the low pressure are quite suitable for ship transport, and um, uh, both of them is um, is possible in the CCS um, chain. Next, please. Okay, I will just focus now on in some pros and cons for the ship transport because there are a lot of benefits. It is uh, economical if you have uh, small volumes and long distances, and it, uh, if it replaces uh, long onshore pipelines, that is um, maybe difficult according to public acceptance. It might be better to um, suggest a ship transport uh, a solution than um, having pipelines uh, onshore. So, um, uh, and the most important of it at all, I think, is the flexibility. You have a chance to change the number of ship and sailing route, and you can add ship if the volume increases and reduce uh, the number of ship if the volumes go down. Pipeline uh, does not have that flexibility. Um, and in addition, you can use the ships after the CCS uh, project is um, done. And if you, uh, you can use it in other application and um, maybe for LPG um, transport. Next, please. Thank you. Um, but of course, there are some downhills as well. It requires um, expensive harbor facilities, especially if the harbor capacity is full and you need quite a lot of space to have this um, intermediate storage. The intermediate storage itself are quite costly. It, of course, it depends on the size, but it is energy demanding to liquefy it and also to store the uh, CO2 in big tankers before the transport. There also might be some issues regarding the materials needed for transporting minus 50 degrees uh, CO2. I think we'll come back to that a bit later in the, in the presentation. So next, please. So there are pros and cons for the um, ship versus pipeline. And uh, we have done a, a quick look at the cost. Of course, it will all depend on the assumption. So in 
this case, we have um, calculated the ships in three different volumes and um, pipes for three different volumes. So we have looked at ships for five, 10 and 20 million ton of CO2 and the same volumes for the pipeline. And then we'll see how far um, distance can you transport the um, CO2 to um, get the break even point for where ship and pipeline um, is the cheapest one. Because for ship, the distance is not that important, but for pipeline, it's nearly linear to the distance. As you can see here, the break even point for ship and pipeline um, is uh, for small volumes, you have um, a distance about 730 kilometers that favorites the ship. If the distance is lower, it will have um, um, pipeline will be the less costly alternative. But if the distance is longer, then it's um, it's um, ship that is better. But for the larger volumes, the distance uh, over uh, 1,180 kilometers will um, favorite the ship. So you can see that the the volumes and the distance are the most um, parameters that affect the cost quite a lot. Okay, uh, next please. <clears throat> so we see for ship transport, about uh, CO2 ship transport of small volumes and pipeline transport of CO2 is common practice today. We have both uh, pipeline uh, onshore and offshore and also ship transport of small volumes um, uh, today. But of course, if we have more CCS projects, there might be a ship transport of larger volumes and, uh, and also more offshore pipeline will be common. As for the ship transport, most of the literature suggested transport near the triple point at seven bar and minus 50. But the existing transport is mainly done at 15 bar and minus 28. In this project in a line, we will focus on these two conditions and look what is the benefit and uh, try to find an optimal solution for the volume and distance we have in these cases. Uh, we also have to take into account that um, conditions considered optimal for transport is not the optimal injection conditions. So uh, the CO2 pressure and temperature during transport will have an impact on both the liquefaction plant and on media storage and ship design, but also it will require some um, conditioning before the injection. So we have to have on board equipment to um, increase the temperature and uh, the pressure before injection. Next, please. Yeah, and that was uh, my final slide. And uh, that was it for me. And I will give the floor to Marielle at TNO, which will give a talk about preventing inactivity during batchwise injection. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm Marielle Kuhne from TNO in the Netherlands. And uh, my part of the webinar uh, focuses on the potential constraints on batchwise injection from a ship into a saline aquifer. By batchwise, we mean that every injection cycle is followed by a shut-in cycle, which is related to the intermittent supply of CO2 when it depends on ship transport and direct unloading from a ship. Next slide, please. So the potential constraints on injection operations in saline aquifers arise by the process of tryout uh, of the near well area and salt precipitation in the pore spaces of the rock. If the salt accumulates, it could completely block the pore space and impair injectivity. In case that injection operations would continue, the bottom hole pressure could increase to values, which could then damage the rock by fracturing. Operations would have to be shut down to remove the salt, which is a costly business. So preventing these issues is much more efficient. Whether salt accumulation occurs depends on both the rock properties and the injection parameters. 
In the figure, you can see three mechanisms for salt precipitation that have been identified. In the middle figure, salt accumulates as a result of a balance between the CO2 injection rate, which controls water evaporation into the gas, and the capillary backflow of brine in the opposite direction as the CO2 flow, which controls the supply of salt. If the injection rate is low, dry out and salt precipitation does not occur, as you can see in the upper figure. However, if the injection rate is high, the backflow of brine cannot keep up with the progression of the dry out zone into the reservoir and only uniform salt precipitation around the rock grains occurs. And this will hardly affect the permeability as well as injectivity. So salt accumulation occurs at a specific balance between the CO2 flow and opposite brine flow. And you can imagine that during shut-in phases, during batch-wise injection, additional backflow of brine will affect this balance. Next slide, please. Our objective uh, is to develop a workflow which can be used to define a safe and efficient operating window for batch-wise injection from ships that prevents injectivity impairment by salt. And we used the TOF2 software and we developed a radial symmetric aquifer model for this purpose, which simulates uh, CO2 injection, both at a continuous rate and batch-wise for comparison. And the model simulates uh, the potential salt precipitation and corresponding changes in permeability and pressure. Next slide, please. So in our first scenarios, we simulated continuous injection and the results show how the salt precipitation is affected by the injection rate. The two figures show results after one year of continuous injection. The left figure shows the fraction of the pore space that is occupied by salt as a function of the distance from the injection well. And the right figure shows the corresponding permeability. At a rel relatively high injection rate, so 20 kilograms per second or 10 kilograms per second, um, the salt fraction remains limited and is rather uniform. And it, it extends several meters away from the injection well into the reservoir. And the corresponding permeability decrease is limited. You can see that in the blue and orange data points. Uh, next. So, at a lower injection rate of 2 kilograms per second, you can see that the salt fraction near the injection well is much higher uh, and it, uh, the salt precipitation did not extend into the reservoir. And the corresponding permeability is close to zero. Uh, so this is a scenario where we have salt accumulation and injectivity impairment. Then if you even uh, lower the injection rate further to 0.2 kilograms per second, shown by the um, yellow data points, you can see that there is hardly any salt uh, that precipitates. So basically you can see here the three mechanisms that I um, uh, talked about before. Next slide, please. So now I will continue with an example for batch-wise injection at an injection rate of 10 kilograms per second for uh, approximately three days with a shut-in period for eight days. You can see in the figure, uh, the blue line, it shows the pressure as a function of time and the pressure increases during each injection phase and then it decreases back to the background values during shut-in time. And this is just a very normal pressure response of an aquifer to CO2 injection. Um, you can also see that with each cycle, the salt fraction slowly increases, uh, shown by the orange data points. Uh, next, please. Then after several cycles, you can see that the pressure during the injection starts to increase significantly um, uh, to values which could fracture the rock. And this is due to the salt accumulation, which now hampers the injectivity. You can see in the last injection cycle that is shown here, 
that the salt fraction has increased to 0.4 of the pore space. Next slide, please. If you increase the injection rates, um, then you will prevent salt accumulation. Um, because now instead um, of uh, salt accumulation, you will have uniform salt precipitation, which does not affect permeability and injectivity. However, as you can see in this figure, the normal pressure response in the first few injection cycle already exceeds a maximum allowable pressure if the injection rate becomes too high. This means that the maximum injection rate is constrained by the transmissivity of the reservoir. So for this particular aquifer with the chosen properties, uh, you could say that the optimal injection rate should be higher than 10 kilograms per second to prevent salt accumulation and injectivity impairment with time, but below 40 kilograms per second to make sure that the normal pressure response does not exceed maximum pressure. Next slide, please. So I would like to end my talk by giving you some key messages from a sensitivity study that we performed on batchwise injection. And we found that the salinity of the brine does not define if, but when complete salt clogging occurs. So this is not a key parameter. Also, the temperature of the injected CO2 showed to have negligible impact on injectivity impairment. Batchwise injection can either enhance or prevent injectivity impairment compared to continuous injection. And this depends highly on the reservoir properties, primarily the permeability and the thickness of the aquifer and also on injection parameters. And these injection parameters is something that we can control. And they include the injection rate as well as the duration of the injection and the shut-in cycles. Overall, we can say that case-specific simulations are needed to define the optimal range of injection parameters for which injectivity impairment by salt precipitation does not occur. Thank you very much for listening. And I would now like to hand over to Arne for the next presentation. Hello, <coughs> my name is Arne Duxta. I'm working at Institute for Energy Technology in Norway. <coughs> I will talk about impurities in the CO2 stream and how that can affect corrosion and material selection. Next slide, please. A lot of scenarios for CO2 emission and CCS have been discussed the last few years. In one of these scenarios, the blue map scenario, it is foreseen that seven to nine gigaton CO2 per year need to be injected and stored on the ground in 2050. A huge amount of pipes and ships are required to transport these quantities. When you burn methane, oil, coal, forming CO2, the volume and the weight have increased two to three times due to the reaction with oxygen. So if you needed a lot of pipelines and ships to produce and distribute the oil and gas, you might need even more transport capacity to get it back into the ground. It is important that we do CCS right from the beginning, and we therefore need to define the safe operation window before the process plants are designed and built. And this is one of our objectives in the Align project. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates the CCS chain. When you capture CO2, you would like to have a, as few as possible restrictions on the amount and types of impurities that can be tolerated in a CO2 downstream the capture plant, as this will reduce the capture and cleaning cost. But it should be noted that the capture plant operator will most probably not be the one that set the final CO2 specification. The required purity of CO2 stream will be di dictated by the various impurity levels that can be accepted and managed by the transport, injection and storage operators. Impurity restrictions will be project specific 
and an optimization process is obviously needed where the cost of purification is balanced against the cost of, for instance, using more resist corrosion resistant materials, the cost of accepting reduced injecti injectivity, and the cost of downtime and repair. When we look at ships, they, will, they can be in carbon steel or also more corrosion resistant material. But what is special with ships, that is the low temperature, possible hydrate formation if you have water, so you need low water content. And you have issues like oxygen and water ingress during off, on and offloading. When it comes to pipelines, they will be built in carbon steel because you need so huge amount of steel. Carbon steel cannot uh, withstand CO2 and free water, it will corrode, it can be corrosion of several tenths of millimeter per year. So aqueous phases need to be avoided. I put aqueous phases instead of water phases on this uh, slide because you can form aqueous phases with very low water content in this CO2 if you have other impurities mixed into this water phase. When it comes to injection, you can use different kinds of steels. But if you do batch injection, you might have brine coming back into the injection tubing. And that you put a lot of restrictions on uh, what kind of material, what kind of impurities you can accept. And also reservoir have their limits. And if you're going to use the CO2, it can have a lot of limits. And if you have network, we need compa compatible streams. And all these different operators will actually set the, set the specification, which has to be communicated back to the capture plant. And I have to do the right cleaning before CO2 is, uh, is, uh, in, is transported further downstream. Next slide, please. In this graph, um, or this slide, we have listed the impurities we regard as most important for corrosion and material selection. These impurities can take part in what we call cross chemical, re chem chemical reactions that gives new products like sulfuric acid, nitric acid, and elemental sulfur. The pink column in the table shows the most referred recommendations found in the literature. Large variation can be seen. Some limits are based on corrosion and material issues, while others were based on health and safety in case of accidental release of CO2. The, <clears throat> the recommendation lack experimental verification, as we have confirmed in a recent review we did in, a, in the Align project. And lack of data is the main reason why the IS, I, ISO standard for CO2 transport does not give recommendation on safe CO2 composition. They say that the most up-to-date research should be consulted during pipeline design. The blue column are impurity levels that have been selected in a couple of projects. And you can see that there are very much less than in the recommendation. That is partly due to the fact that some of these low values you get automatically out from an mine plant. But for instance, oxygen in these tables, that needs special cleaning. The green table shows list of impurities we have tested in an experiment I will show at the end of the presentation. All the impurities in the green column is less than proposed in this recommendation that should be noted. And the gray column are impurity levels we are working on in the Align project. In the Align project, we are focusing on ship, ship, ship transport condition. That means low pressure, high, low temperature, minus 28 C, 15 bar. Next slide. This shows an experimental setup we, we are using when we are studying impurity reactions and formation of corrosive phases. It's a high pressure autoclave that can be rotated on a shaft you can see in the picture. This CO2 and impurities can be feeded to the test autoclave, autoclave through separate lines. So you see a lot of thin steel lines there. The feeding is done continuously and when we feed CO2 and impurities continuously, we also need to vent something 
continuously. And by measuring the composition in the feed and the composition in the venting gas, we can actually measure what type of reactions going on. In the, to in the top of the slide, you see a lot of numbers. That is the dynamics recommendation. And it is the actual uh, composition we used in the experiment, which is called IFE experiment feed. When, so when these small amount of impurities react, you don't form much corrosive phases. That is il illustrated with a one droplet coming from the tap. If something happens, you will maximum get 0.1 milliliter of liquid. So you need a rotating system with a rotating sample seen on a torpedo to the right, because you have to mobilize this very tiny droplet. If you should expect any corrosion at all in stagnant systems, it will just fall to the bottom due to gravity. Next slide. This is the result of this experiment. I know if you look at the top of the slide, you can see the feed again and you can see the composition of the vented CO2. Apparently, almost all impurities have reacted, and that is actually confirmed by the corrosion of the steel. So in, in this case, we have shown that the recommendation actually gives a lot of corrosion. And the question is, can it then be accepted? The next slide, please. This was what we saw when you opened the system after a few weeks exposure. We saw sulfuric and nitric acid in the autoclave as a green liquid. We saw lumps of wet sulfur. And these products actually formed in this, uh, in this blend of impurities. And it's a question if you can accept this at all in a pipeline. You cannot accept that you form tons of sulfur or tons of uh, strong acids. Next slide, please. And I Come to the last slide. It's gap and challenges we identified during the review. We need to develop models to determine safe operation windows and to design and operate CCS system efficiently and at minimum cost. And we need, need then to be able to predict formation of corrosive phases, formation of solid sulfur, and accumulation of impurities when you do depressurization of the system. You need to generate experimental data for validation of model, models and tools. And you also need model and tools for handling upset condition. Because it's very dif dif difficult to foresee that you are able to operate all these systems, particularly when you come to networks without any upsets. And what do you do when you get a lot of water into the system? What kind of tools do you have available? And you should also remember that material selection doesn't solve all problems. When you form, for instance, sulfuric and nitric acid, it's not a question of material. You have to operate the system so you avoid the formation of these type of products. And you also need to monitor off-spec CO2. But how do you monitor an off-spec CO2 if the products already have reacted? Then the CO2 will look actually clean. That finished my talk, and now we will go to the network talk by Anna. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Anna. Um, so uh, everyone has heard uh, the everyone has work has heard the very valuable, detailed work that we are doing in the Alliance CCUS uh, project on the different aspects. Uh, relating to transport. Uh, in my talk, we are going to focus a little bit on the bigger picture, and we are going to see how we actually try to tackle the challenges uh, that we have in CCS and CCUS that require the design of a flexible CO2 transport and storage network. Next slide, please. So if we look at uh, what happens uh, in general in, in, the, in reality today with regards to CCUS, we can see that there are big funding gaps and permitting delays for projects, uh, which means that we have to have a large degree of inbuilt flexibility. Uh, for example, we need to consider different capture routes for our CO2. 
uh, perhaps different percentage of capture from different sources, and also utilize uh, different means of CO2 transport, as you have heard already about pipelines and ships. Uh, we also have to consider the possibility of utilizing a number of CO2 storage sites concurrently or in sequence, and these sites must be available to take the CO2 that comes from our capture sources via the different transport networks. This means, uh, of course, that uh, there are significant uncertainties around long-term investment in these opportunities. And there are, as you have heard earlier, significant uncertainties around the technical aspects that relate to CO2 transport, CO2 injection, uh, storage site capacity, uh, that uh, we have not touched upon uh, today. And therefore, all these uh, technical and uh, financial or market uncertainties can affect significantly the performance of future CCS supply chains that we wish to uh, implement. Uh, for this reason, we have to do some work that aims at reducing the risk and allowing us to do uh, what we want to do uh, at large uh, commercial scale. Uh, in order to achieve that, we have to consider how we reduce risk, not only at component level, but also at system level, integrating all the different elements of the value chain and also considering a multi-period planning horizon. Next slide, please. So the questions that we need to address in such a decision framework is how to use the flexibility to explore the different options for system development in the face of even future uncertainties. We have to consider what is the relative importance of market uncertainties and investment uncertainties, as well as the technical differences between different means of uh, transport, different sources of CO2 and different storage sites, uh, which might be at different depths, might require different specifications and how this affects the value of investment needs to be uh, accounted for. And we also need to establish uh, robust interim strategies that uh, de-risk CCS initiators and safeguard uh, the CCS development. And finally, design strategies that offset the risks of investment in all parts of the chain and promote deployment of a transport and a storage infrastructure before market demand actually requires this. Next slide, please. So how do we do this? Um, in our team at Imperial College, we have developed a, a costing a tool that allows us to calculate reasonably accurately how much it costs to store CO2 at a particular storage site, considering its specific characteristics. In the slide that you can see here, uh, you can see an example of a central North Sea field that is close to the end of its life and could be considered for uh, CO2 enhanced oil recovery and later on for CO2 storage. Uh, you can see that uh, at the lower part of the uh, figure, there are some uh, negative uh, costs, which are of course uh, 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 funding that needs to be spent in order to do uh, uh, platform modification, uh, plugging, decommissioning activities, uh, monitoring activities during the life of the field. We also need to uh, uh, consider the costs of uh, uh, CAPEX support, uh, depreciation, taxes, and uh, uh, long-term loans that need to be uh, used during the life of the facility. On the positive side, you can see we have the income from the production of uh, incremental uh, oil, but we also have the income that might come from uh, CO2 storage activities. And this uh, income would depend very much on what is the price of the CO2. We can actually consider all these parameters in our modeling, and then we can calculate what you can see on the right-hand side on a nice a uh, red and green dial, uh, the internal rate of return for a particular project and its NPV, which we can then consider as part of a larger network that has a number of storage sites and different means for CO2 transport. Next slide, please. So 
if we uh, now uh, um, uh, blow uh, the, the picture a little bit more and we look at the even larger uh, level, you will see that uh, in our methodology, we are using a real options framework to actually uh, put together the CO2 transport and storage uh, network characteristics. Uh, we need to be able to optimize these characteristics considering the utilization of a number of storage sites, uh, considering their specific storage capacity, injectivity characteristics, uh, the costing that you have seen we have done for an individual storage site, but we also have to consider the transport network flexibilities that we may have, like for example, pipeline distance, uh, pipeline sizing, flow rates that we may choose to use, uh, or even uh, the sequencing of different uh, storage site uh, connectivity. Now, to do all of this, we have to uh, also consider what you can see in two boxes at the lower uh, part of this figure. We have to consider market uncertainties, such as the CO2 price and the oil price as well, if uh, EOR is uh, one of the options, as well as regulatory uncertainties uh, for example, uh, capital support that might or might not be available, the carbon floor pricing, tax credits that might be offered to storage. All of these characteristics we have actually brought together in an integrated framework that uh, we can uh, consider in a real options setting and allows us to develop optimized CCS network designs as well as calculate the real options project value in a similar way as our colleagues uh, in uh, economics uh, normally do and calculate what is the value at risk for different scenarios. Next slide, please. Here you can see an example of how this methodology works, which is similar to what is uh, a traditional black souls model. Uh, you can see uh, that uh, what we have in a financial call options in the blue column on the left hand side are the stock price. In the case of a CO2 transport and storage network is the CO2 market price and the equivalence for CO2 floor price, time to exercise uh, the risk free interest rate, the volatility of CO2 market price. All of this we have to consider in a, a, a framework that considers the exogenous market uncertainty, the exogenous policy uncertainty, as well as endogenous uncertainties that relate to the uh, carbon uh, network design options and the geological storage site uncertainty. All of this allow us to design supply scenarios and for different supply scenarios, match them with possible storage scenarios that we can analyze in the real options framework I just discussed with you. Next slide, please. So in the Alliance CCUS project, what is different from the work that we have done previously and I have discussed very briefly with you here, uh, we are extending the tools we have developed to include other elements to the value chain. So first of all, there is the capture uh, part, which is depicted in the figure that you can see on the onshore network that is picking up CO2 from a number of different sources and delivering to a terminal that might be taking the CO2 offshore. And some of these facilities might be actually industrial CCUS facilities, or it might, they might involve energy storage options and conversion components which we have not previously dealt with in uh, our transport and uh, storage and network infrastructure. Uh, we also need to add the shipping element, which you can see depicted in the, in the figure, that allows us to combine possible pipelines as well as transport routes for the CO2 that might be utilizing a number of offshore sites that you can see depicted in a uh, different uh, sort of uh, uh, pale and darker colors on the offshore element of the value chain. Uh, so for our model to be able to select the sites appropriate, appropriately, we have to design it in such a way that it considers a number of different candidate sites, the costing of different options, for example, 
um, uh, using a platform for a CO2 injection or actually injecting the CO2 directly from the ship, uh, the opportunity to have a temporary CO2 storage or even having a floating CO2 storage hub, which if we account correctly for the technical characteristics and the consequential cost uh, options, we can actually optimally design and select in a multi-period framework, which then makes uh, uh, some lines uh, solid while others remain pale gray color in the background. Next slide, please. So here you see an example of the a very preliminary model testing that we have done in the last uh, few months since we started our work in this uh, uh, particular activity in Align CCUS, uh, which has been designed for uh, uh, testing different CO2 uh, supply routes via shipping, uh, picking up the CO2 from two hubs that we have identified in Rotterdam and Amsterdam and utilizing a number of different offshore sites. So we have tested whether our model would consider different size of SIPs. Of course, the 50 kiloton SIPs are a little bit too large for what we might be considering. But what you can see is that the model is functioning correctly, that it is actually distinguishing which routes might be used by the larger and which routes might be used by the smaller SIPs and, and how they can be optimized. Next slide, please. So what we are uh, aiming to do in uh, Align CCUS is actually to have a testing of this uh, full chain system that considers uh, shipping as well as pipeline uh, options, considering the technical constraints as well as the economic and market constraints, and test this at the number of uh, sites and clusters that we have uh, in Align CCUS. So you can see them on this slide in different colored uh, areas. So we have uh, one uh, set of activities that are focusing on the T-side and grains mouth industrial clusters, where we are looking to model an optimal CCS transport and storage value chain that incorporates a number of site uncertainties and flexibility in operation and design. In Rotterdam, the industrial cluster is uh, quite different because we are looking at the uh, decarbonization from a number of different uh, facilities. Uh, uh, we need to look at uh, CO2 infrastructure and storage uh, costs for uh, conversion of power and industry to long carbon processes based on uh, uh, hydrogen, syngas, nitrogen and low level heat. Uh, we also have an additional uh, cluster site in North Rhine, uh, Westphalia, where we are focusing on uh, supporting a number of CO2 and hydrogen sources and CCU product demand within that cluster and identify possible infrastructure systems that can deliver this. And finally, we are looking at planning a shared infrastructure and transport uh, network for the Grenland region in Norway, where we are considering uh, different options for capture, conditioning, uh, pre-intermediate storage, transport, loading, a number of different uh, vessel sizes and onshore and offshore unloading facilities. We have a busy time ahead of us in the Alliance CCUS project and uh, we are looking forward to uh, tackling these challenges. Uh, thank you very much. This was my last slide. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Anna. Um, so we're now about to begin our uh, the, the answering of the questions you have been submitted during the, the presentations. And as a reminder, you can still submit questions uh, through this questions pane in your uh, at, at your uh, control panel. Um, so I will start with the first question I see here. And I guess that's a question for Arne. Um, Arne, CO2 has been transported in pipeline for many years in the US. Um, do you have any idea what the water content of this CO2 streams in those pipeline is? And if there is any water in it, how did they handle it?
Anna, can you, did you hear my question? Sorry, I forgot to switch on the microphone. <laughs> okay. But well, did you get my question or? Yes, I, I have okay. a question. Okay. It is, it's not much information in open literature about these pipelines. And it's also difficult to uh, distinguish between um, design values and actual measurements and operation. But what you normally see is a water range from 50 to 650 ppm V water, which is far below the solubility of water in pure CO2. And I also have good experience. And that I think is mainly because I don't have much other impurities in the CO2 in these uh, existing pipeline systems. They have H2S and sometimes a little oxygen, but not these other impurities we are very concerned about when it comes to CCS, and that is impurities like uh, NOx and SOx, mm -hmm. and CO and some other impurities. Yes. Okay, thank you for this uh, for this answer. Um, I have here another question. Um, let me see. I have here a question for, uh, I think, Mariella. Um, is there any field evidence for injection issues due to the salt precipitation you, uh, you talked about? Um, yes, well, there is indirect ev uh, field evidence. Um, for example, in the Ketzin uh, aquifer in Germany, uh, but also in uh, Snowfeet in Norway, um, so basically what they found, they had some injectivity issues and they did see a pressure increase um, and um, they thought it might be uh, the result of salt precipitation around the well bore. Um, so what they did is they had to shut down the operations and they injected some, uh, a mixture of water with some chemicals to, uh, to dissolve the salt and then they could continue uh, operations. So um, they did a weekly mitigation procedure, uh, injecting such a, uh, such a fluid to, uh, um, to limit the negative effects of salt precipitation. So basically from um, the fact that the permeability was partially repaired after those mitigation uh, procedures, um, that was uh, some sort of an indirect evidence, uh, so to say, that salt precipitation occurred in uh, in the snow feet, uh, field. Okay, thank you um, for, this, for this answer. Um, I have another question, I guess, for Ragnhild, because it's consider considered the ship transport. Uh, what, what size of ships are suitable for CO2 transport, and what size of ships are typically used in CO2 transport right now? Yeah, you can uh, use um, a lot of different sizes. Uh, in the literature, it's uh, from depending from 1,000 tons up to, I guess, 50 tons. But the ship transport today is um, food grade CO2. Uh, it's uh, around uh, 1,800 tons. So they're quite small ships. But they are possible to have bigger ships. And the one constraint is that if you have Big ships, you need um, uh, large tankers on before the transport, and that is costly. So it is maybe it's more optimal to have a smaller ship who comes often uh, than bigger ship that uh, requires big um, storage in advance the the transport. But it depends on the volume and the length, of course. But today it's. The ship for food grade is about uh, 1,800 um, tons CO2. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, and then I think this question is also for, for Arne. Um, it says, in, the, in which way will the results of Align CCUS project will be disseminated to the ISO TC265 to develop new standards or revise existing ones? And that concerns, I think, uh, CO2 compositions. 
<laughs> Could you please repeat the question? I was so eager to get the microphone on that. I <laughs> okay. um, in which way will the results of the Align CCUS project be disseminated to ISO TC 265 to develop new standards or to revise existing ones? And that is concerning the, the CO2 composition. <clears throat> yeah, all, all uh, information we find uh, valuable for this ISO work will be directed to ISO. I, I'm sitting in this ISO uh, group that actually made this uh, standard in 2016. And ISO is now also working on flow assurance issues. And we'll probably make a document for that, which will be very interesting both for the line project and all other projects. So we will definitely use uh, some of the new learnings there. Okay, thanks. Um, here's a question about modeling. So I guess I will refer that to, uh, to Anna. Um, concerning modeling, do you also take into account the possibility of reusing the infrastructure of oil and gas sector that otherwise should be decommissioned? Yeah, that, very good question. This is uh, very important. Um, we, of course, the, uh, building a new infrastructure is uh, one opportunity, but we're using other infrastructure is also a significant consideration. Uh, we have this uh, consideration in the Alliance CUS project, and definitely we will be using it in uh, the modeling. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and here, I guess, is another one for, for Anna, since you are already answering some questions. Um, optimization of CO2 transport have been done on economic basis. Are you planning to take into account environmental criteria like CO2 emissions for the transport of CO2 by ships? Yes, of course, we can do that. Yes, this, this is an important uh, point as well. This was uh, a part of our uh, discussion in a recent meeting. So a very topical question was uh, submitted here. Thank you for this. Yes, uh, our uh, research group uh, at Imperial College works uh, quite uh, uh, a lot on life cycle assessment of engineering systems. So we have the means to account for the CO2 footprint of uh, different activities. Uh, we have also quite a bit of work on uh, techno-economic and environmental optimization. So this is going to be uh, another element that we are going to consider in this work. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, and here's another one, I think, for, uh, for Ragnhild. Um, is there a vessel or a ship that uh, can be used for uh, sea shipping as well as inland shipping? Um, yes, it is. Uh, you can, it depends on um, it depends on where to go, <laughs> but uh, it is uh, it is um, suitable. But of course, some of the ships going in um, in inland and uh, on rivers is not suitable for for the harsh weather in the North Sea. But um, but uh, the the ships can be made. Um, made uh, to to do both of them so of course but it requires a bit more when they're going to the north sea and and with harsh weather okay thank you um i think we have time for one last question and the questions are remaining will be uh will be handled by uh by email separately um this is a question for mariella um it's quite a long question so pay attention <laughs> mariella um it's, it's a question uh, we are injecting periodically at the Equistar storage sites, ranging from zero tons per day to uh, two and a half thousand tons per day. The power plant has little to no experience on how to manage the injection well. We have terabytes of injection pressure data, and there is a need to develop a best practice for the large scale injection. So we have, they have lots of data and lots of problems. Um, so, could you, in this in this case, help uh, with your modeling tools to figure out how to do this in a in a good way? Um, do I understand correctly that um, the question is how to manage the pressure in the injection yeah. well? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because that sounds more like an engineering uh, uh, problem. Um, 
and that is uh, the software that we use is specifically um, uh, for subsurface uh, and, and flow through porous media. So I think if you um, if you want to know how to control your pressure at the surface, then you would have to look for um, for models that simulate the conditions from injection well to downhole. So that sounds more. Um, I know that colleagues of ours in uh, in Delft, they they use the Olga software. Um, to simulate uh, what happens to the CO2 from the injection point to the bottom hole. So um, I don't know if this is uh, the answer that uh, <laughs> that person was looking for, um, but the software that we use does not sound very suitable for, uh, for this question. Um, okay. Well, I think that that's Good enough for now, and uh, we will we will take also the answering of this question maybe uh, maybe offline. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Thank okay, you. thank you. Okay, so yeah, we're out of time already. Uh, so I want to thank everybody for attending today's webinar and also for for asking questions. Um, so once you uh, you leave this uh, this webinar session, you will receive uh, a survey on the presentations and the. Uh, the whole uh, webinar so we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback so that we can learn from it and improve uh, in the future on this um, and you will also receive a follow-up email with a link to our uh, webinar uh, within the next uh, one or two days so on behalf of all the presenters the team uh, at SCCS uh, I would like to thank you for joining this uh, this webinar today and have a great day uh, for the rest of the day okay Thank you very much. Bye-bye.